the overarching topic of the second week is universality in random matrices. Universality is a key concept, not just in random matrices, but in the whole of probability, mathematical and statistical physics. And in random matrices, in the last decade, there have been um, spectacular developments in proving decades-long conjectures on various aspects of universality. And so we'll hear from the topmost experts on the topic. Our first lecturer doesn't really need an introduction. He's made fundamental breakthroughs in more domains of mathematics than most graduate students take classes in. We are fortunate that one of those domains was random matrix theory. Our first lecturer for today is Terry Tao from UCLA. And his title is Some Universality Techniques for Random Matrix Ensembles. I actually changed my title a little bit from what I announced at the beginning to accept it for the, for the uh, uh, category of the other lectures. So actually, my new title, uh, I'm actually going to cover very Oh, is that on? OK. Oh. Okay, so I'm actually going to cover three topics, uh, only well, which are all loosely uh, um, connected to uni universality, but uh, not as much as I was uh, planning to do initially. So um, the three top three topics of this uh, lecture series will be following: first of all, uh, least singular values, random matrices. Um, second is the circular law. Well, IID matrices. Actually, here we'll, we'll also be working mostly with IID matrices. I'll tell you what IID matrix is in, in, in just a second. Um, and uh, this topic we'll, we'll use as, as a key input uh, material from the first uh, topic. And then the, th the third topic, which is uh, not really related, uh, is the, the linear exchange. or strategy, uh, which is uh, one of the key uh, uh, tools that we have nowadays to, uh, uh, to prove universality results um, for Wigner matrices in particular, but actually also IID matrices. Um, it isn't the only tool. You can't do everything with this method, but you can do some, uh, some stuff. Okay, usually you combine it with, with other methods to get the best results. Okay, but so uh, today, in the first two lectures, I think we'll be focusing on least singular values. Okay, so um, you all know the singular value decomposition, hopefully. Um, so if you have an n by p matrix, m of, say, complex numbers, and let's say p is less than n, then we have a singular value decomposition. Okay, m can always be factored uh, as um, the product of a, of a unitary matrix, n by n, uh, times a diagonal matrix, uh, or as, as diagonal as you can, given that it's rectangular. Um, so it will be an n by p matrix. So it will be diagonal in the p by p block, and then a big block of zeros, and then uh, another matrix, uh, another p by p unitary matrix. OK? So you can always factor uh, an arbitrary matrix by two unitaries and um, um, an essentially diagonal matrix. And these numbers are non negative, and you can arrange them in, increasing, in decreasing order. OK? And these are the singular values. Of the matrix. Okay, so they're very important, almost as important as the eigenvalues. Um, of course, if you matrix with Hermitian, uh, the singular values are just the, the absolute values of the eigenvalues. Uh, otherwise, the, the relationship is more complicated. Um, okay, but uh, in practice, the most important singular values, um, we, well, they're, they're all important, but, but, uh, but the most important usually are the largest singular value and the smallest singular value. So the, the largest singular value of a matrix is also the operator norm. So another way to think about it is that it's the supremum of mx over all unit vectors. So the, uh, the largest singular value is the largest that, uh, that a matrix can dilate 
um, uh, getting data to vector. Of course, here I'm using the L2 norm always uh, for vectors. Okay, so that's the largest singular value, and uh, similarly, the, the smallest singular value is, uh, is the inf. Okay, so it's it's the uh, it's 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 the it's the most that uh, uh, that uh, it's the most contractive that, that your matrix can be. Um, you can also think of it as the normal alpha norm of the inverse uh, to the inverse uh, if it is uh, matrix is invertible. Um, okay, so if matrix is square and it's invertible, you can also think of it as um, as the normal of the inverse. So the, the least the least single value measures how invertible your matrix is. If you have a square matrix. Uh, your matrix is invertible if and only if your least singular value is non-zero. Okay, so it's always non-negative, and it's zero exactly when your, your matrix has full rank, um, or in the case of square matrices, when it is invertible. Okay, so um, th these numbers show up all the time um, when you're studying other statistics of, of random matrices. So it, it is important to understand um, these numbers uh, for various um, matrix models. Now, uh, there, are very, there are many matrix models that we'll care about, but for this, uh, uh, for lectures one and two, we will care mostly about um, IID random matrices. So these are matrices, n by p, uh, where all these guys are random numbers, random complex variables. Uh, which would be identically and independently uh, distributed. So every single entry has the same distribution, and they're all independent. Okay, uh, it's customary to normalize these to mean zero and variance one. Um, and in fact, for most of, of the lectures, just for simplicity, uh, we will focus mostly uh, on the case of uh, Bernoulli random matrices. where not only are your IID, but actually uh, each of the random variables is just plus or minus one with a 50-50 chance of each. Okay, so these are also called random sign matrices. Okay, so you just take your n by p matrix and you just randomly fill your entries with plus or minus ones. You flip, you flip a different coin for each one, each one of these, of these um, entries and you get a random matrix ensemble. Okay, and uh, this is a very typical uh, uh, example of ID random matrix. Uh, it's the most uh, combinatorial um, of these ensembles. So, so at the other extreme, you can also talk about Gaussian random matrices where the entries uh, here are Gaussian random variables. Um, so that's a special case which you can often um, do uh, explicitly by other methods. So as you may have seen in other, um, in other lectures already, when you have a Gaussian random matrix, the, uh, the um, many distributions, such as the, the joint distribution of the singular values or the eigenvalues, has um, um, have some very nice explicit formulas, you know, in terms of log gases or something, um, and uh, or determinant of processes or whatever, uh, um, and uh, you can compute these things um, explicitly. But when you leave the Gaussian world and you, you work with these more combinatorial models, such as Bernoulli random matrices, uh, then you do not have nice formulas for uh, the, the the distribution of of, uh, of the singular values and so forth. Um, for example, um, well, well, for example, uh, you know, this is a discrete ensemble, right? So there's, 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 there's only finitely many different matrices here. So um, you no longer get a continuous uh, density function. There's no, there's no longer a joint distribution, which is a um, there's no longer a PDF of the uh, um, uh, of these of these singular values. It's just a, some some discrete prob probability distribution, which has a rather complicated formula, which is almost never usable directly. Okay, so we would like to, to, uh, to, to have tools to understand the behavior of, of matrices such as a Bernoulli random matrix. Yeah. Okay, you can consider many, many other, other random models, you know, you know for example, Ur Erdős Renyi graphs or, uh, okay, uh, you know, or sparse things, or, or, or uh, basically, I mean, it, it, uh, these models are almost as general as, as arbitrary random graphs. Um, um, I should mention that, uh, that it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's sort of clear since I'm, I'm, I'm having P and, and, and different, but th these are not emission matrices by any stretch. Even when N, even when N and P are equal, uh, we're not imposing any symmetry on, this, uh, on, on these matrices. So, so um, they're not symmetric, um, and that actually complicates the analysis. Um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't make, it doesn't actually make things simpler uh, for, for this, for this um, 
um, for part one. But for part two, it certainly makes things more complicated, the fact that you're not in emission when we start talking about eigenvalues. Okay. All right. Um, so the basic questions we have, okay, so which will be the topic of our today, is, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, is, um, okay, so, so given a, if M is an N by P random matrix, let's say random Bernoulli matrix, for simplicity, okay, what is the behavior The larger singular value and the smaller singular value. Okay, so um, okay, so these the answers to these questions will turn out to be important for part two. So, uh, but but these are also some interesting questions in in, in their own right. Okay, now um, of the two, the, um, the 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 largest singular value is by far the easier one to deal with, and there are many many tools to uh, to understand the. Uh, uh, because there's also the operator norm, and, and, and there's, there's, there's many things you can do. Um, so, for example, you, you, you could, you could uh, try to understand the largest singular value um, using um, the moment method, for instance. You know, so, um, you, can, you can relate the operator norm to, um, um, you can take, uh, for example, the, the trace of mm star, m times its adjoint, and this is just the sum of, of the eigenvalues, of, sorry, of the singular values squared. Um, so in, in particular, it bounds the, the, the first singular value squared. Okay, so if you can compute this sort of second moment type quantity of, of your matrix, then you can, then you can certainly bound, um, the, at least upper bound, the, uh, the, the largest uh, um, um, singular value. And you know, more generally, if you, can, you can bound any, any even power of, of the singular value by an appropriate power of mm star, and uh, okay, and we have lots of tools for understanding um, these sort of sums. These are fairly explicit polynomial expressions of the coefficients, and so um, this you can already use. Um, uh, and you, you take it by taking k moderately large, you can get some actually quite precise control um, of, on the largest single value by um, ideas like this. Um, but I won't talk about this. Maybe it will be talked about in other lectures, um, because this this sort of method doesn't tell you very much about the least single value. Um, it, it uh, yeah, um, yeah, you know, you would like to control a negative moment somehow if you wanted to, 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 uh, to control the least single value. And so um, this method turns out not to be so, um, so good uh, for answering the second question. So we're going to focus on, on, a, on a different method, which is called the epsilon net method. which um, gives weaker results than, than the moment method. It, 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 it doesn't give as strong bounds on, on the largest single value, but it, um, it has the advantage that it, it, it gives, a, or it can do something. Uh, it can say, um, it can, uh, say something about the, the, the least single value, uh, whereas the moment method can't, really can't do much about, uh, about this, uh, um, this edge less spectrum. Okay, so uh, let's first talk about this method in the context of the largest single value. So the basic theorem we're going to prove here is that uh, with M being a matrix like this, um, there exists a constant C positive, okay, such that um, um, such that the, the largest single value is in fact smaller than a constant times root n with exponentially high, with exponentially high probability. Okay, so what that means is that. Uh, the problem is that it is not like not less than c, c root n. It is actually small. It is actually exponentially small okay, for some absolute constant c. Okay, so outside of a really really tiny event, uh, the operator norm of, of your matrix here, this is random Bernoulli matrix, is basically root n. Okay. Um, all right. So this, uh, this this is this is the first result. Okay. So you know the trivial bound by the way is is, is n. Like if, if all the entries were plus one, if they're all plus one then uh, the, the operator norm here would be basically n. Um, OK, but usually you get a square root uh, saving because of the random signs. OK, so, um, yeah, so if you use the moment method, uh, C, you, you can show that any c bigger than 2 works. But uh, the argument I give will not give c as low as 2. I think it gives them like 4 or 8. Um, so it's a little bit weaker, but, but up to a constant, it, it gives you comparable results. All right. so. Um, the way you prove this 
uh, is that you, you, we will rely mostly on, so um, we won't use the moment method. We will just use um, um, this supremo definition of the, um, uh, of the uh, largest single value. OK, so we will just go ahead and compute this sort of by brute force. Um, OK, so the probability that the operator norm is, is bigger than c root n is, is the probability of the soup of all unit vectors. Um, that, um, so if the operator norm is bigger than, than c root n, then that means that there's some unit vector such that uh, m implies that unit vector is also bigger than c root n. OK? So this is, this is the probability of a union. Okay, so you take a union over all unit vectors. For every unit vector, there's an event. Okay, so for every unit vector, there's a chance that that, that unit vector is the bad single vector. That, 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 that unit vector might be the vector that makes this, uh, this, uh, this, this quantity big. Um, and then you're taking the union of all these um, events, and we're trying to show that this probability is exponentially small. Okay, so um, the most naive thing you could do here, uh, and it's, it's way too naive, is the union bound. Um, so, okay, so you can say, oh, okay, this is a union, so I, I can bound this by um, sum over all unit vectors of this probability. Now, now uh, the good news is that for each individual x, uh, this is actually fairly small, okay? So, so there are these sort of Chernoff type inequalities, and we'll, we'll get to those later, that each individual one of these probabilities is certainly exponentially small which it sort of has to be, because if, if, if you want the whole thing to be exponentially small, certainly each, each one of these smaller events has to be exponentially small. But uh, this, you know, the moment you do this, you've already lost the game, because uh, there are uncountably many points on the sphere, okay? and you're summing uncountably many points, and, and no matter what, what, how good a bound you, you have on each individual term, um, in fact, you can't even do this because the probability is not uncountably additive. Um, okay. So uh, you don't actually do this. Um, okay, so the union bound directly doesn't work. Um, but uh, this is way too wasteful, okay? Because, you know, there's, so there's an uncountable number of points in the sphere, so there's an uncountable number of events here, but um, many of them overlap each other um, um, very tightly. You know, if, if two points x on the sphere are very close together, then say x and y are very close together, then the event that mx is big and the event that, that my is big should be almost um, um, coinciding. And then using the union bound to bound events that are almost, the union events are almost coinciding is very inefficient. So, um, you want to improve this argument by um, not taking the union, by replacing this uncountable union, which you can't bound by the union bound, by some more discrete uh, union over more separated points, x and y, so, so that you don't sort of um, reuse the same event over and over again. You try to reduce the overlap so that the union bound becomes uh, more efficient. Okay? Uh, okay. Oh, so so uh, so p is just oh yeah so um, in, it, uh, yeah p for the up for the um, um, largest single value uh, um, p is not going to be very important so so p is just anything less than n uh, did I not see that yeah um, oh yeah so um, for, for this theorem you could assume without loss of generality that, that p equals n actually because um, if you have a, a n by p matrix then it is uh, of course you can think of it as a minor of an n by n Bernoulli matrix. And if you can bound the operator norm of the bigger matrix, then you, you certainly bound the operator norm of the smaller matrix. Um, so you, you certainly get, um, uh, yeah, so if you can do this for P or square matrices, you, you get it for rectangular matrices for free. Um, yeah, okay, so if you like, you can think of this as being square matrices. Uh, P will become more important when we deal with the least single value. Okay, but yeah, for now, if you wish, you can think of this as being square. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is that uh, so we, we have this uncountable unit sphere here. Okay. Um, ah, so x is taking values uh, in, okay, so, so x takes values in, 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 in CP. Actually, because it's, it doesn't really matter, but because it's a Bernoulli matrix, you can actually just, without, um, you can restrict to, to, uh, to, to real vectors um, because, because this is, the, uh, what, but anyway. Um, all right. Okay, so we, we have this big sphere here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna discretize the sphere. Um, so we're gonna pick some, some small scale epsilon. 
Uh, actually, epsilon you can eventually take it to be something like one-tenth or something. Uh, so you take a small parameter epsilon, and we, we'll pick, okay, so we'll, we'll let uh, that sigma be what's called a maximal epsilon net in the sphere. Okay, so it's, uh, okay, so in the sphere, you take a finite set of points, uh, sigma, which is an epsilon net. So epsilon net means, means that all points in sigma have, are separated by distance um, at least epsilon. Okay, so all, all these points are at least epsilon apart. And uh, maximal means, means that, uh, that, that, uh, that um, or it's maximal, that you, you, you can't add any more. Okay, so you can't, add, you can't add any other point. Can't make sigma any bigger. Okay, there's no other point on the sphere that you can add to this, this, uh, this set without destroying the epsilon net property. Um, now we're saying that is that every point on the sphere lies within epsilon of one point on this net. Okay, so that's called an epsilon net. Um, so these things always exist uh, just from the greedy algorithm. Well, okay, you can use Zorn's lemma. That's really overkill. Okay, but okay, just the the the, the, uh, the, um, um, the, um, the, the greedy algorithm would do it. Um, Okay, so so the, so I mean it's a bit hard to write them down um, explicitly, um, but uh, uh, but you can, but you can certainly um, show that they exist. Um, all right, so um, all right, so, so 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 what's what's so good about these these sets? So so first of all, um, they're not too big. Uh, so so there's a, there's a cardinality bound. Okay, we we can bound how big these are, um, and okay. Uh, you could be more precise than this, but but uh, the cardinality would um, you can bound it by something which is exponential in n, or well, in p, but certainly but, but certainly in n. That, that it is bounded by some constant multiple of one over epsilon raised to the power n. Okay, so so if epsilon is like, say one over ten, then this would be something like ten to the n, or maybe 40, 40 to the n. So the, um, these these nets they are moderately large, they're, ex they're exponentially large, but they're not uncountably large, which was which was the problem we had we had previously. Okay, so uh, there is some bound. It's not so great, especially when epsilon gets small. This is not a great bound, but but it is uh, it is a bound. Okay, so uh, this um, this is a fairly easy bound. It uh, it follows from what's called the volume packing argument. Okay, see what you can do is that if you have this net around every point in the net, you you form a little ball. You take the ball of radius epsilon over two. So around every point in this net, you take a, a ball like this. And because it's an epsilon net, because all points are separated by at least epsilon, then by the triangle inequality, all these balls are disjoint. Okay, so you, you, you can fatten up each of these points into a ball, and, and all these balls are uh, disjoint. And on the other hand, um, just by the triangle inequality, all these balls will um, they're disjoint, and they lie inside, for example, the ball of radius 2. Okay, that's a bit crude, but. Uh, but all these balls certainly lie inside the ball of radius two because they're centralized on the you know, sphere, and the radius is is uh, uh, okay. Let's say epsilon is less than one. Okay, so um, so they're all disjoint. So therefore, just by counting volume, the number of points here is at most the volume of the ball of radius two over the volume of the ball, ball of radius um, epsilon over two. Okay, and this is some constant times two to the n. This is constant times epsilon over two to the n, and then you just divide. In fact, I, I, I even got a, a precise constant here. So in, in fact, uh, you can balance by, by four over epsilon to the n. Okay, this is not the best bound you can do for sphere packing, uh, but that's not not the point. Um, okay, um, you could, I mean, it's, it's within a constant of, 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 of optimal actually. So it's uh, up, up to this four. This is the best possible, and and, and because I'm not, I'm not caring about optimizing this c, um, this this is good enough. Okay, so on the one hand, we have some, some finiteness, some bound on, um, on this net. And then the second thing is that this uncountable soup here, you can bound by, by this, by a countable soup, by a finite soup. Okay, so the other fact is that as soon as epsilon is less than one half, um, the, uh, Um, this uncountable soup here uh, is actually bounded by twice a 
finite soup. Okay, so we had an uncountable soup which was causing us trouble in our first attempt to prove this theorem. Uh, but I can bound it up to a, a factor two, which I won't care about because I'm not trying to optimize the C. Um, I can bound it by this finite soup. Okay, so, um, so th this is, uh, um, okay, so why is this true? So first of all, this is, this is also the operator normal case. Okay, so this is actually um, quite easy. Okay, so the operator norm is, is this soup. Okay, so the soup is attained somewhere. So, so there is some point on the unit sphere this view is compact, uh, the operator norm is the operator norm of, uh, of mx for some, for some un unit vector. Okay, for some. Okay, now this, un this unit vector, this point, point in the sphere, doesn't lie in the net necessarily. Okay, if it did, then, then we'd be done, we wouldn't need this too. Um, but it lies close to, it, it lies close to the net. Okay, so this x, uh, so there the, the must exist a point in the net Which is within epsilon of of the uh, of, of this point here. Okay, so you have point x, which which, which isn't on uh, in the net necessarily, but it is, it is within epsilon of some of a point y, which is in the net. So just by the triangle inequality, I can find that m y plus m of x minus y. Okay. Now this I can bound by the soup over the net. And this I can just bound by the operator norm times this, this, the lengthless vector, which is epsilon, and most epsilon. Okay, so um, as long as epsilon is at least one half, I can, I, uh, this error term can be absorbed into the, uh, the left-hand side and giving up a factor of two. Okay, so you get, uh, okay, so you get this bound here. All right. All right, and so hence, um, yeah, so going back to this, this easy problem of bounding the largest things of value, um, so the, um, this is bound, this was the, uh, the uncountable soup, but, but using this, uh, this fact here, taking epsilon to be one half, say, yeah, so, so for this problem, actually, the optimal epsilon is one half, um, so I can just bound this by um, probably that the, the soup over the, um, um, this net is bounded by, okay, uh, but I, I need this now to be bounded by, I think, C over two. Okay, so using this bound, I can bound the uncountable soup by this, this finite soup, and now it is, um, I just realized that sigma is a bad choice of uh, uh, notation here, but um, okay, but I can now, I can now bound, uh, use the union bound, and, and now I'm not immediately dead yet. So, um, okay, and because of, because of this cardinality bound, so this is bounded by, I guess, four of epsilon, it's uh, you can have explicit constant eight to the end, an exponential factor times the soup over all x. Okay, so see, we started with a probability with a soup inside, um, and now we've taken the soup outside using the union bound, and, but we have, we have to pay this factor. Um, this kind of factor is sometimes called an entropy cost. Okay. It's the price you pay because you don't know in advance which x is going to work, or which x is going to be the worst x um, in advance here. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you knew if there's a fixed x which was always the worst, then you could forget all the, about the, all the other x's and then you wouldn't lose anything. But the, the, the x which is the worst, we, we don't know where it is, but we know it's close to one of the points on this net and so um, if you want to, to freeze x and you just want to work with a single x, you have to pay the entropy cost, which is, which is the, the metric entropy of, of, of the set, the number of points, or the number of, really of, of genuinely distinct points um, in your parameter space. Okay, so this is, just, this is just a price you have to pay, but as, um, as long as the bound here is, is, is exponentially better than the, the entropy cost, uh, you, you can still win. Okay, so this is now a much simpler problem. We just need to estimate a single um, um, event like this rather than a union. Okay, and uh, this can be handled by 
uh, or by various techniques. Um, so, um, all right. So, uh, first of all, I, I can square it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, okay. Let's see. So, so, so M is an N by P matrix. Okay. So uh, X is was was this um, P, um, P by one matrix vector X. Um, M you can think of it as as a bunch of rows. Okay. So. I can think of this matrix as a bunch of independent rows. Okay. And, e and each one of these rows is just a random element of a discrete cube. There's a minus one plus one to the p. Um, so the entries just are just random signs. Uh, but, but also, because the this was an IID matrix, all these rows are independent. So these are uniformly distributed on the cube and, and independent um, variables. So, so mx. It's just uh, it's an n by one vector, and it's uh, it's just the dot products. Okay, so th this vector is just a whole bunch of independent random variables, and each random variable is just a dot product of a random vector with a fixed x. Okay, so 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 x is deterministic. Now this is just a a, a um, fixed bunch of numbers. You you, you dot this number with a uh, a whole bunch of, of random vectors, and then you, uh, you you add them all up. Okay, so this is. Okay, so Pythagoras is theorem. This is the same thing as saying the probability of the sum of x i dot x squared is bigger than c squared and over four. Okay, so I just square I just uh, square both sides. Use Pythagoras. Okay, so what I got here, I've got the probability that the sum of a bunch of independent random variables is, uh, uh, I, I need a large deviation estimate. But what, is, what is the probability that, the, that, that this, this sum is, is very big? Okay, now we have no shortage of tools to understand sums of independent random variables uh, in probability. Um, so you know, at this point, you can pull out your churn off or your, house, your hofting inequality or whatever. Um, so, um, Okay, so um, okay, maybe in the interest of time, I'll, uh, this, is, this is covered in, in, in the notes. But the um, yeah, maybe actually just to to, to save a bit of time. So um, the way you prove things like churn off inequality usually is that you tr you try to control this by some sort of exponential moment. Um, so you can you can bound this by the exponential moment. You, you take some exponential of of uh, of some. moment here, you have to divide by uh, exponential of t c squared n over 4. Okay, so this just Markov's inequality. Um, and the point is that this is something you can compute because, uh, because uh, there's, there's some factors uh, quite nicely uh, if, you, if you actually work it all out because, because of all the independence. So this is something you can compute, and this is true for, for, for any t bigger than 0. Um, and uh, Okay, and so th this is increasing in t, this is decreasing in t, this is 